Welcome back to the remarkable history of the Henry George School of Social Science. I am Edward J. Dodson. This is part four, New York City crisis and the long road to partial recovery. The school held its 21st annual conference in 1965 in California, attended by over 250 persons. The reports of activity would have made most attendees feel positive about the school's continued effectiveness as a recruiting arm of the Henry George movement. Courses were being taught not only in English, but in Spanish, French, and Hebrew. The school's annual report for 1966 stated, quote, about 2,700 students throughout the United States and the world completed the course in fundamental economics in class or by correspondence. These photographs come from a newspaper article on the school's extension operating in Marin County, California. The instructor shown here is Robert DeFemery. The 1967 report noted that between 1932, when the school was founded in 1967, over 125,000 students had completed the school's basic course. Not reported on was how many went on to complete the school's three-course program, how many had continued in association with the school as an instructor or volunteer, or how many became involved in any way with the other Henry George's groups or organizations. The fortunes of the school and most of its extensions and affiliates were about to change rather dramatically. In February of 1968, Board President Arnold Weinstein traveled to Phoenix, Arizona to meet with David Lincoln, the person who had the most influence over funding to the school by the foundation established following the death of his father, John C. Lincoln. A few months after Arnold Weinstein's meeting with David Lincoln, the longtime director of the school, Robert Clancy, was dismissed. Ironically, Clancy's promotion to director had come as a result of the recommendation by John C. Lincoln back in 1946, and for a short period, Clancy had served on the board of the Lincoln Foundation until removed by cause Clancy was employed by a recipient of foundation funding. Although the school had its charter from the state of New York, completion of the school's curriculum did not come with a degree. Students were not tested on their absorption of the course material. There were no papers assigned. The school offered personal enrichment, but no credentials. And by the middle of the 20th century, the school was in competition with low cost degree granting community colleges and state colleges and universities. During 1969, Arnold Weinstein met with two members of the Lincoln Foundation's board, Dr. A.M. Woodruff and Dr. Raymond Moley, to discuss implementing changes at the school designed to move the school in the direction of a degree-granting institution. Moley had once been a member of Franklin Roosevelt's Brains Trust, along with Adolph Burrell and Rexford Tugwell. The following quote comes from an internal memorandum. Mr. Weinstein reported on his conversation with Dr. A.M. Woodruff and Dr. Raymond Moley regarding a proposal for the accreditation of a course for state certification of social studies teachers and an accredited course for high school seniors. Both ideas were endorsed in principle by Dr. Woodruff and Dr. Moley and will be explored further with them. During 1970, William Truhart was enlisted to examine the situation. His report delivered to the board in October was titled, quote, A Synthesis of Views for Upgrading the Educational Activities of the Henry George School of Social Science. Based on this report and other considerations, funding by the Lincoln Foundation for the 1971-72 school year was reduced from 200000 to $100,000. This decision came despite the increased costs incurred by programs initiated at the request of the Foundation. The immediate consequences of the reduction in funding were the elimination of the school's correspondence courses and the closing of the Boston Extension. 
the situation was quickly deteriorating. Most of the funding to extensions and affiliates would have to be withdrawn until one or more new funding sources could be found. Although teaching history at a high school on Long Island, Stan Rubenstein agreed to come in as acting director until a full-time director could be found. In 1977, Philip Finkelstein, a professor of political science and deputy city administrator in New York City, was made director. Phil Finkelstein brought strong credentials to his position with the school. He had a law degree from New York University, had worked as a journalist, as a deputy to New York Mayor John Lindsay, and taught political science at Brooklyn College and Adelphi University. He remained associated with the Graduate School of Social Work at Adelphi University until his untimely death in 1982. Two years before becoming director of the New York School, Phil founded the Center for Local Tax Research. One of the first publications from his work was titled Effective Real Property Tax Rates in the Metropolitan Area of New York. A book was later published coming out of a four-year study of the city's property tax assessment system. 1979 was a very big year within the Henry George's community. Progress in poverty was still in print and still finding readers around the globe. A centennial celebration of progress in poverty was planned in San Francisco with 35 individual presentations over a five-day program. As Henry Georges around the world prepared for the centennial celebration of Henry Georges book Progress in Poverty, Stan Rubenstein, who in 1967 had established an extension of the school in Long Island, New York, took a hard look at the state of the movement and the importance of the educational effort. He wrote, The avant-garde of the Georgist movement can trace their roots to our magnum opus and to its study in formal classes. Sadly, however, throughout the country, fewer classes and fewer graduates are being developed. Unless this condition is reversed, we may be past the point of no growth. We may be losing more men and women through attrition that we are gaining through our courses. He continues, at this moment in history, when hope and vigor ought to permeate our souls, when the portents indicate to those with the slightest vision that now is the time to reach for the stars, we seem dispirited, hopeless, and apathetic. Yet this need not be the case. Successful classes on Long Island have led to a renewed faith in teaching, leaving class discussion leaders with that warm glow we experienced during our introduction to this challenging philosophy. Social, political, and cultural forces have made our task more difficult. Classes must conform to our changing audience. Ideas, no matter how valid, cannot be shared with a group that is unable to understand them. In 1981, the school's board of trustees decided to sell the school's longtime home, purchase a building that could be renovated to meet the school's current needs, and hopefully add needed funds to the school's financial assets. The new building was located at 5 East 44th Street, a short walk from the city's main commuter rail system at Grand Central Station. Mark Sullivan was hired in 1981 as the school's research librarian and as a member of the faculty. Mark also served as the secretary and treasurer of the Council of Georgia's Organizations. He remained on the staff of the school until 1992, leaving to join the staff of the Robert Schockenbach Foundation. He continues his involvement with Georgia's education today as a board member of the Henry George Institute. Stan retired from his position as a history teacher at Oceanside High School to accept the appointment at the beginning of 1983 as director of the New York School following the death of Phil Finkelstein. Residing on Long Island, Stan also did his best to keep the Long Island extension up and running. He was able to do so until he lost two of his longtime teachers, 
Jerry Schleicher, who moved to Florida, and Samuel Schreck, who died in 1999. In 1984, Stan Rubenstein and George Collins produced a 12-part video series titled Understanding Economics to be broadcast over cable television in partnership with station WIUP-TV of Indiana, Pennsylvania. In 1986, Paul Nix, who had served for eight years as president of the board, decided to step down. At the February board meeting, I was elected to take over as president. Then in April of 1987, Stan Rubenstein announced completion of a new 15-part set of lessons for the Land and Freedom series to be used in high schools. An earlier 20-part series on American studies reached over 2,000 high school educators nationwide. This is a photograph of the Board of Trustees in 1989. This was also the year when the school moved into new quarters, purchasing a building at 121 East 30th Street. The location was residential in character and attracted many students from the surrounding area. Here is another photograph with a closer view of the building's entrance. With the purchase of this new building, the Grand Central Station experiment was brought to a close. At the beginning of 1989, Stan Rubenstein announced that he would be stepping down as director. George Collins, the director of the extension in Philadelphia, was chosen to succeed him. Stan wanted to focus his energy promoting the school's high school program and began setting up meetings with high school teachers. Also in 1989, Lindy Davies moved to New York to join the staff of the school as assistant director. He remained until 1997 when he was appointed director of the Henry George Institute. George Collins accepted the huge challenge of rebuilding the enrollment of adults into the school's three-course program. Enrollments and completions for the fall 1989 term were encouraging. 84 students received certificates. In the February 1990 issue of the Henry George Newsletter, I expressed sincere optimism about the school's future and its influence on public thinking. I wrote, for now, we Georgists and the various organizations with which we are associated remain only minor players in the public dialogue. Nevertheless, our message is spreading, and an understanding of the principles we espouse is finding an increasingly receptive audience. The work has been going on now for over a century, and for over 50 years under the auspices of the school. Our commitment continues. History's lesson is that liberty, seldom secured, is never secure. On the 2nd of March, 1991, Alana Hartzog was at the school to conduct a one-day seminar titled Economic Justice and Land Rights with 34 participants. Alana developed this seminar because of the difficulty getting social and environmental activists to enroll in and attend a 10-week course on the principles of political economy. The school then benefited by election of Heather Remoff to the Board of Trustees. Heather came to embrace the principles embraced by Henry George out of her deep interest as a scientist in the evolution of human behavior and social organization. In the January-February 1992 issue of the Henry George Newsletter, Heather explained how she came to enroll in the courses at the Extension in Philadelphia. It must be a bit more than five years now. I was working on a book about reproductive strategies, and I became convinced in doing the research that economic behavior and reproductive behavior were closely entwined but I started taking courses at the school by sheer fortuitous chance. I came across the flyer right by the checkout counter in the Philadelphia library. I felt like it was destiny grabbing me by the hair because I already concluded that a better understanding of economic principles had become vital for my research. 
The New York School embarked on a different and ambitious effort to add factual data and statistical precision to corroborate Henry George's theoretical analysis. The economist Michael Hudson joined the staff as research director. He would share his perspectives in the pages of the Henry George News. At the end of 1995, I stepped down as president of the New York School. My professional responsibilities had recently intensified, and I found I could no longer devote the time required to effectively fulfill the duties as president. I also had become quite concerned over the functioning of the school. In February of 1996, I presented to the board a proposal for reorganization of the school for the following reasons. We are struggling with and are in conflict over numerous aspects of how the school's programs are designed and implemented, over the use of resources, both people and financial, and over the style of organization and management that ought to prevail at the school. Thus far, we have attempted to address these issues and challenges piecemeal. The result has been to generate considerable animosity, mistrust, and misunderstanding on the part of trustees toward one another and toward George Collins and his staff and vice versa. We debate endlessly over whether decisions being made and contemplated are appropriate expressions of the board's fiduciary responsibilities or are evidence of micromanagement. George Collins is applauded for the expansive program he and his staff conducts and for the return of students in meaningful numbers to the school. At the same time, he is criticized for what some feel is a failure to address serious operational issues and staffing problems, and by some for his failure to carry out stated or unstated directives of the board. The reorganization plan I submitted for discussion was extensive. As events unfolded, it became clear that the level of energy and commitment required to address the problems I felt were readily apparent did not exist. I remained on the board for the remainder of 1996, then stepped down permanently. Oscar Johansson, whose history with the school went back to 1938, succeeded me as president. He began teaching at the school in the early 1950s, served on the board of the New Jersey School for a number of years. Then, in 1960, he was elected to the board of the Robert Schockenbach Foundation. Oscar continued his formal education, earning an MBA degree in 1967 at New York University. He kept going, earning his PhD in philosophy at NYU in 1983. Oscar died on the 8th of January, 2002, in his 96th year. In 1995, Oscar Johansson stepped down as president and Sidney Mayers was elected to succeed him. Sidney's association with the school went back to 1940 as a student. As an instructor, he proved to be something of an innovator, as indicated by what was written in the February 1942 issue of The Freeman. Sidney Mayers has undertaken an experiment to improve attendance and increase comprehension by students. At midterm, Mr. Mayers interrupts the regular flow of lessons and devotes an entire meeting to review. Special invitations for this review session are mailed to all enrollees. Sidney died on the 30th of December 2007 at age 100. Dan Christen, first elected to the board in 2002, then became president of the school. Dan died in January 2012 at age 69. Time moved on, and the time finally came in 1998 when George Collins retired from teaching and as director in New York. He continued to be involved in the Henry George community, however, and in 2004 was elected to the board of the Robert Schockenbach Foundation. Today, he enjoys a private life in retirement. Thomas Smith was appointed to succeed him as Director of Education. Soon, however, it became apparent that Dr. Smith could not devote the time necessary to fulfill the responsibilities of Director. Mike Curtis was invited to take over, which he did in 2000. After four years, Mike stepped down, returning to his home in Arden, Delaware. 
He also returned to handling students enrolled in the correspondence courses offered by the Henry George Institute. Here is Mike in 2018, delivering a talk on behalf of the Arden Georges Guild. Kai Hayner came to the New York School at the beginning of the 1990s and soon joined the faculty as a volunteer teacher of fundamental economics. In 2004, he succeeded Mike Curtis as education director. Kai remained with the school until 2011 or 2013, leaving to join the faculty of the New York Institute of Technology. He has since returned to the home of his birth, Germany. And we now have reached the end of part four in this history of the Henry George School of Social Science.